Well, welcome back again uh, to the Winter School and uh, to, to your session today, uh, which uh, also interestingly is very topical since you're going to talk about uh, health and uh, investing in health in, uh, in low and medium income countries, which obviously includes uh, India. So without further ado, um, you know, I will hand over to you, but yes, before a couple of housekeeping matters for those of you who may have not uh, joined in yesterday, uh, please um, keep posting your questions in the chat box. And uh, I presume personally that uh, you will pause from to, to look at the box. So how would you want to do this? I think the q and box would be better. Uh, the questions should be posted in Q. Oh, and I'm I sorry. Uh, I got it backwards. I yes, I, I I got that backwards in the webinar mode. I think uh, the questions will be posted in the Q and A box, and uh, uh, and the speaker will look at it. Otherwise, I will from time to time. If there is a large number of questions um, uh, piling up, uh, I will uh, look at the box. Um, with two kinds of questions. If there are immediate clarificatory questions, then of course they can be posed to the speaker right away. But if there are uh, questions which are more of a commentary type nature, then maybe we can uh, start clubbing there. So uh, without further ado, welcome again. And uh, on this very important day, uh, uh, it's all yours now. All right, thank you so much. Just uh, one, one uh, thing I've learned from experience, it's actually quite tricky to monitor the the Q and A while uh, talking, or at least it's tricky for me. I'm not very good at multitasking, and so Shikran, I would really appreciate if you don't mind actually monitoring for me the, the Q and A, and if there is a question that's a clarifying question that makes sense to ask, uh, feel free to interrupt me, and otherwise I will pause um, at regular sure. interval. Okay, I, thank you I'd so much. Be, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, so I'm going to All right. myself now. Yeah. So I'm going to share uh, my screen and. Uh, we are going to talk today about um, the demand for health. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I spent quite a bit of time arguing that good health is a critical economic asset, um, you know, at the level of the country, at the level of the individual or the household. That's not the only reason why we care about good health. Uh, good health is also very valuable in itself. Um, you know, we all know that life is more pleasant uh, when one is not uh, suffering from an ailment or when uh, children are not at risk uh, of dying. And so that's for these this, this, this two reasons, the fact that good health is important um, for productivity, but maybe more importantly, that good health is an end in itself, that three of the eight MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, called for specific health improvements by 2015, reducing child death, reducing maternal mortality, answering the spread of HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB. So 2015 has, has come and gone, and a good deal of progress actually happened, but it didn't, we didn't quite get there. So if you look at the progress between 1990 and uh, 2015, you see that overall the map, and the same color coding in these two maps, 1990, 2015, has become much less red. There's a lot of red, especially in Southern Africa, no, it's all gone. And then countries like India have really improved. Um, they, you know, they were in the orange um, category, with it, which is an over 100 um, deaths per 1,000. Um, and according to this map, they are now in the yellow category, which is less than 50. OK, so huge, huge improvements uh, on that front. Um, I could also show uh, maternal mortality, and it's been also improving quite a bit. Um, so there's been a lot of progress, but there is still uh, some countries where the mortality rate remains uh, very high, above, above 100. Okay, so we have, we've not gone all the way um, to uh, reducing these um, problems um, as expected. And if you look at some statistics, I put here um, some numbers uh, from the World Development Indicators for 2005, 2007, um, and uh, again, um, about 10 years later, 2013, 2015, depending on what I could find in the WDI. And I put India here since uh, most of you are in India. And then a few African countries, Kenya, Malawi, Mali. Uh, oh, why is India here again? Okay, there is two India. <laughs> it's a very important country, so it gets two columns. Uh, there is Peru, there is Nicaragua. And then um, I guess, oh, I know I messed up. Um, I meant to actually have France, which is my, my uh, native country and the US, my uh, country of adoption. Um, 
just as kind of like a, a benchmark for the US is not a great benchmark for health because the US actually has a lot of issues. So France is kind of like a better benchmark. So it's it's not from uh, on that uh, table. Sorry for the for the mistake here, but um, never mind. We can uh, keep going. You see, the life expectancy at birth has really increased over this period in countries like uh, you know Malawi it went from 52 to 63, or Mali 48 to 58. It's actually quite remarkable to gain 10 years in life expectancy in just uh, less than 10 years. You know, in contrast, in the US there was barely any change. Um, or in Latin American countries, uh, uh, Central American countries, uh, Latin American countries, there was not much change. But in Southern Africa, there was a massive improvement. Uh, India is middle of the road. And then infant mortality, you see some of these gains. Maternal mortality, uh, is, it has, you know, there's been gain, it's still, it's still quite high. Um, if you contrast, for example, with the US, where you have only 14 uh, expectant mothers who die out of 100,000 giving birth. Uh, the number is, you know, 50 times that um, in 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 Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and then stunting remains a big problem. Um, I didn't have uh, numbers for stunting from the early period, but for the later period here in red, it's still very high. 38% of under five kids in India are considered stunted. 26% in Kenya, 42% in Malawi. Very high numbers. Okay, um, so this, there are a lot of remaining problems. And at the same time, as countries grow, uh, there seems to be also a shift towards non-communicable diseases becoming more important. That's in part mechanical, as people live longer, the likelihood that they get cancer increases, the likelihood that they get cardiovascular diseases increases. But actually, part of the non-communicable diseases uh, that are growing are actually um, not related to longevity necessarily. Uh, for example, diabetes, is an issue, uh, including in India, um, and that's um, that's that's a growing concern. Okay, on top of uh, the ones I've just mentioned. So, what are the culprits behind this? You know, uh, much worse health outcomes in in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, um, and in other uh, lower and middle-income countries compared to higher-income countries. Well, we talked at length yesterday about the geography, the fact that you know a lot of um, lower-income countries face an extra burden from tropical diseases. They also have a very unfavorable climate with um, much more chances of, of drought or extreme weather events, which makes you know, uh, nutrition be uh, at times difficult because if you have a lot of droughts, a lot of floods and extreme um, situations where households are lacking food for a while, this can lead to long lasting, um, uh, you know, challenges to, to, to growth uh, for children. So today we're not gonna talk about this. You know, this was the topic of yesterday. Um, we're gonna think about the other potential culprits. One could be poor institutions uh, or poor supply of healthcare. Think of the lack of appropriate medicines or vaccines or you know, not enough trained professionals, not access to the technology, uh, or maybe the technology is there, the, the professionals are there, but they are not well governed. And so you have a lot of absenteeism, a lot of corruption. So all of these issues, uh, around um, the supply, we're gonna talk about them tomorrow. Today, we're gonna focus on the third potential culprit behind um, the, the remaining health issues, which would be poor private health behavior, okay? And we're gonna try to think about the extent to which uh, the onus is on the households um, and whether changing their behavior would you know, get rid of the problem. Um, just to pre preview, the answer is going to be no. The answer is going to be yes, there are things that you can do to increase adoption of health products by households, but honestly, that's not going to get you that far because many of the issues that they are facing are kind of uh, on uh, more like infrastructural uh, or on, on environmental. And so, really, you're not going to make progress if you don't tackle the two big elephants in the room, which are going to be one and two. Okay. So today we're going to see how far can we go in try uh, in trying to you know, um, reduce the disease um, uh, burden or the, the mortality and the morbidity uh, through individual behavior. And that's actually an area where I've dedicated a lot of my own time and research. I spent the last 15 years <laughs> studying this. So I'm not trying to say it's not important. I'm just saying it's actually you know not where you get the highest return for your bank. It's just for your back. It may be um, you know, the 
only thing that, 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 that can be done for a while or the only thing that can be done, um, you, know, uh, you know, easily. And so that's why there is some, uh, some work on that. But I, 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 I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time tomorrow talking about uh, this part, uh, which is very important, okay? But so why ex ante could we think that maybe, you know, individual behavior is, is very important? Well, it's because if you look at the cause of death, uh, there was this very uh, influential article in The Lancet in 2003 that said um, that about two thirds of under five deaths in the world, uh, is, and most of them are in, um, in poor countries, could be averted if the parents of the children who die use simple, relatively cheap preventative technologies such as antimalarial bed nets, bleach for water purification, or as kids to avoid dehydration during diarrhea episodes and things like that. Okay, so the key question is, why don't uh, uh, more people use these technologies? And there's been a huge increase in coverage with these technologies over the past 15 years, in part thanks to the research I'm going to talk about today. So some of the research that I'm going to talk about has helped advance the debate and solve some of the bottlenecks. And so now there's much more, um, you know, many more programs to try to increase access to all these products, and they have been successful, and they have contributed to the decline in mortality. Okay, um, but how far they go, you know, is going to be um, is going to be limited. So. The roadmap for today, we're going to first go through a model of the demand for health. It's going to be very simple. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to fit in one slide. It's just going to be to, to illustrate the various um, parameters that we need to, to think about. Okay. Uh, and then once we've kind of established what are the key things we need to think about, we're going to like go through them, um, you know, uh, one by one, thinking about the empirical facts we, we know about them. Uh, as well as the uh, potential policy interventions uh, that we can think of uh, and the extent to which they have been successful so far. So here's my simple one slide model. Um, people will invest in a specific health product or a specific health behavior if, guess what, uh, the, the expected discounted private benefit is uh, at least as high as the expected discounted private cost. Okay. So it's all about benefit uh, versus cost, um, which means that people's perceptions of the benefits is gonna be very important. Whether the benefits are private versus social is gonna be important. Um, and obviously the costs are gonna be important as well, okay? When we think about cost, it's not just the financial cost, it's also non-pecuniary costs, such as you know how painful you know, um, getting the, a needle in my arm is, or how you know uh, how much side effect a given medication has, how uh, you know complex and time consuming it is to to uh, go all the way um, to get care and things like that. Uh, obviously, the horizon over which the costs and the benefits are going to accrue is also going to be very important. If it's a high cost, uh, you know, on one day against um, a very diffuse benefit over many, many, many years that I discount, um, then it's gonna be um, less uh, likely that I engage in the behavior. Um, and you're gonna have this you know, difference between treatment and prevention that comes also um, from, the, from, from, from that time horizon, okay? So if you think about treatment, the willingness to um, take up a treatment, you're going to take a treatment if you're sick, if the marginal utility cost of the treatment is smaller than the marginal benefit of the treatment, okay? Um, for prevention, it's, you know, the, the same, except that now the benefits are going to be discounted, okay? Um, and that there is also a probability of getting sick that's going to come into play. And so if people are mistaken about, um, in their expectations about the likelihood that they can get uh, sick, for example, that may affect uh, how much they want to prevent, okay? And in this very simple model, I assume that the patient is the person making the decision. So I look at my private benefit versus, you know, my private cost. But obviously, you know, um, you know, from your own lives that very often it's not the patient making the decision. For example, if you think about a child being sick, it's the parents um, who are gonna decide whether or not to take the child for care. And so it, it could be that the decision maker values the health of certain members of the household more than that of others. 
Um, and Sorry. so this, um, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, there is a question uh, from Mario Milone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it says, uh, are we assuming that people, i.e. parents know about possible medications, about the possible medications? Um, sorry, do, do I assume that people know about what's possible? About the possible medications, the medicines. Yeah, no, yeah, so they may not know. So information may not be there. So if there is no information, if I don't know that something actually has, you can, you can, in this model, you would set this as like the benefit, the private benefit, the perceived private benefit is zero. I don't even know it exists. Okay. I don't even know it exists. So I'm not, I'm not even, so you, you, it's kind of like a, you can think of it as a, you know, um, case where it's, it's akin to the private benefit being perceived to be zero, okay? And then when people get access to the information, then that's when they realize, oh, actually the private benefit is is um, is much higher than that. And so then they're gonna compare it with the cost. So as I'm sorry, this is a, since it's a clarificatory question, can yeah. I ask Mario um, if, uh, um, if if there is, a, I, was, I, I was just trying to- uh, uh, Hello? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, sorry. Um, my name is, is Mariam from UCSD. I'm, uh, now this, this you you answered perfectly. Uh, the, my, my when I saw the model, I thought uh, you have to assume that people know in order to do this cost benefit comparison. And then I was thinking about this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right. Um, so. Oops. Okay. So that was my very simple model, okay? Uh, and, and you can see just with that, you can already think through a lot, okay? So now we're gonna go through some key empirical facts about the demand for health uh, in four countries. And the first fact that we're gonna, uh, that I just wanted to highlight um, is the fact that there is uh, discrimination within the household, okay? So it's gonna come at no surprise to you know, many of you um, who are based in India because a lot of the examples I'm gonna provide are from, from India. So just one example is this uh, you know, paper published in a journal called Heart. It's a medicine paper that documents gender differences in the utilization of surgery for congenital heart disease in India. Very simple uh, you know, paper. They just show that uh, among households who are told that their newborn child has a life-threatening heart defect, uh, only 44% of the parents bring their girl for the surgery um, versus 70% of the boys. Okay, so the gender of the child with a heart defect is very highly um, predictive of whether or not the child is gonna get the care. Okay, so that's just one piece of evidence that um, the willingness to undergo a given uh, procedure or even cost um, to you know, deal with a health situation uh, may be differential across uh, members of the household. This is evidence from some uh, work I'm doing uh, with Radhika Jane. Uh, uh, looking in Rajasthan, this is using data from the BSBY um, state health insurance scheme um, that was running between 2015 and, and 2019. And uh, this is just showing the share of the claims filed by hospitals. So each time a patient comes in to get uh, care under the program, the hospitals file a claim directly into the IT system. And um, there is like 6 million claims over the you know, 20, December 2015 to uh, October 2019 period. And um, of, of those claims, if you look by, by age group, among the children uh, below 10, um, less than a third of the claims are filed for uh, female uh, patients. Between 10 and 20, it's just about 40%. Um, it's only for the childbearing age groups that it's uh, at all just about 50%. And then it goes under 50% again. Okay, and this is these this gaps here, this difference between 50% and um, what we see is much bigger than the gap uh, between um, the the the, the, um, the the gap between the sex ratio and 50%. Okay, you know that there is um, you know missing there are missing women uh, in the set of Rajasthan, like in India as a whole, uh, but the sex ratio in, in Rajasthan is just about zero. Point uh, forty-eight, which is like forty-eight um, percent of the population is female, um, even in in that age group. Um, and here we see only 30, 33 percent of the claims are for female. Okay. And so what we do in the paper with Radhika, we actually rule out that this could be explained by differential incidence um, of of the disease. In fact, we see that this share female uh, that now looking at the twenty to twenty to forty-five year olds um, is you know 
much below 50% for many specialties. This is orthopedics, plastic surgery, chest surgery, cardiology, neurology, um, you know, many different things. And for, you know, specific types of diseases that we know from, let's say, the global disease burden database or from looking at other, uh, you know, for India or looking at other contexts, we know that these diseases are not differentially affected gender. And we see a big gap uh, in the data. Okay, so this, we take this as evidence that households are actually less likely to bring women to the hospital for care, conditional on someone being sick. Um, and that's despite the fact that in principle, this Rajasthan um, healthcare program was, was free. Okay, so even when it's free care, uh, we see that uh, women are less likely to be brought to the hospital. And um, there is, you know, this, this gap between men and women, uh, our girl, uh, children, and boy children has been, you know, very well documented, as you know. Um, and more recently, there's a paper by Jayeshwara and Pandey published in the ER that actually showed that the gap is, um, uh, is due in part to a preference for sons, but especially the first son. Okay, so even among boys, it turned out that there is a pecking order, and if you're the first-born son, um, you, you're, you're really uh, doing, doing better. Um, and if you're not the firstborn son, then you're actually underinvested in by your parents. And so how do they show that? Well, they, they came around to this realization when they were trying to explain why um, South Asian children seem to be shorter than they should be. And what does it mean to be shorter than you should be? Like if you uh, look at the correlation between the height for HZ score and the GDP per capita in your birth year, um, you know, India and Bangladesh and Nepal are clear outliers uh compared to to this uh, regression line okay um and so these are on, in blue are all african countries okay and so there is this puzzle that um you know children in bangladesh in india and in nepal are actually as stunted uh if not more as uh, african children even though uh they are um they are they are richer uh, than many african countries uh or for the stem income level um African countries are doing much better on that front. And so they document that this uh, you know, height penalty is actually experienced only for higher order children, okay? So the, 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 first, uh, the firstborns, the, the birth order one, these are the firstborns. In Africa and in India, they are equally stunted, okay? Uh, but it's for higher order children that you see a gap emerge. And so it's the higher order children in India that seem to be disproportionately um, hurt. Okay, and so this was, you know, very illuminating because when you see it like that, and they can show that the holds within household, it's not just that households with a lot of children are poor uh, in India and disproportionately so in India than in Africa. They show that the holds within household. So this actually rules out a number of explanations. You could have said, well, you know, maybe African, uh, sorry, maybe Indian children are stunted because of um, of vegetarianism or because of, you know, the environment, open defecation, all sorts of stuff like that. But you can't actually explain that there is differences within the household. This really shows that it's within the household. It's like the higher order birth children are the ones who are stunted, not the firstborn. So if it was about the environment or about the diet, it would affect the firstborn the same way. Okay, so it was very um, important uh, piece of evidence that it has to be somehow about how the households invest in the children uh, differentially. Um, and for if you're a girl, it's kind of like uh, even worse with this penalty. If you're a higher order ch child, you can see it here from this regression. This is comparing, um, you know, uh, the firstborn in India uh, is actually better off than the African counterpart, but not if you're a girl, um, because if you add this coefficient and this coefficient, you get something close to zero. And then if you're a second born in India, you're now uh, starting to do worse uh, relatively, um, and even more so if you're a girl. And if you're a third-born child, you do question. really badly. Yeah. There is a clarificatory question. I unmuted that person, so uh, maybe he can ask uh, his own question. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that may be quicker. Uh, I ended up uh, removing that question from the chat box. Yeah. So can yeah, you um, may I ask a question? Yes, please. So uh, when we are saying that girls were less uh, reported to the hospitals, so how do we find out how many uh, female, uh, how many um, females in the population were actually sick? 
Yes, uh, so I think you're, you're referring to, um, to this. So we, we do not know because we only, we only know, uh, we only have claims data, okay? So we only see whether you show up at the hospital or not. We don't know, we didn't do a household survey that would tell us, okay, that, that share of men and that share of women were sick. We are just um, saying that the gap in the incidence of illness would have to be very large to explain this. And it's not consistent with what we observe in most other countries uh, or in what even the Global Disease Burden Database says for India, okay? So okay. If the, the, the likelihood that, for example, the likelihood that uh, uh, a female or a male um, person who is, let's say, 40 years old would develop uh, you know, a chronic kidney condition is you know, identical. It's identical in India, it's identical you know, in, in many parts of the world. And in our data set, we find that only 28% you know, of the chronic kidney patients are female, okay? So we don't know for sure, we just you know, assume that the incidence for a number of diseases is the same. Um, and the only reason why for this age group, you see that the, it's, a, it's closer to 50% is because of, of childbearing. And so most of the visits that women do around that uh, time, even though we excluded the deliveries themselves, but most of the visits that they do are visits for you know, general medicine or visits to the general world, which are related to the, to the delivery. And in fact, in a paper, we show that they happen typically just before the delivery. So women sometimes come to the hospital a week before the delivery because there is some, um, you know, they're in pain, there's something going on and then they can be in the hospital for a few days and then they go back home and then they come to deliver. And that would be, those would be registered as claims that are not counted as delivery claims. And so they show up here. So most of this is due to delivery. If you remove everything that was related to, to childbearing or everything that was related to OBGYN, you would be much below. Okay. So uh, let me, let me move on. So this was just kind of like a, just to, to, to start by saying not, not everyone's health is, is, uh, is, is, is valued high, uh, as highly, okay? And it's gonna be um, really important because it, it can explain why even as you do some of the intervention that I'm gonna talk about later, you may not actually get um, all the benefit that you would hope for, okay? So now I let's- I had a question about the, the Pandey Jayachandran paper, which is always, yeah. I've always had whenever I've listened to it it's that you're looking within the same household, but you're looking in the same household at different points in time. And it could just be that preferences are not really different, but you have income effects set in um, because you have more children. So when you're comparing the first child with the third child, the household is in a different situation in terms of um, how much food it has per member and so on. And if stunting really depends on what you have in the early period of your life, then it just doesn't seem that that's conclusive in saying that it's later birth orders are discriminated against. So I might be missing something, but this is always something that struck me when I looked at that paper. So I think, I think that's, that's why they have the comparison with, with, um, with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where it really helps because that argument uh, can be made equally for Sub-Saharan Africa. If it's just like as we have more children, we have less resources, um, then you, you can you can um, you would have exactly the same uh, the same mechanism happen. And so the fact that it's they are estimating the effect of being higher order in India over and beyond what you see in Southern Africa, that's where um, that, that's where the argument comes. Um, uh, all right. There's a question that have you also adjusted for sex ratio. Yeah, yes, as I mentioned, the sex ratio is, is, is much closer to 50%. It's 48% uh, in Rajasthan. So sex ratio cannot explain. Um, I mean, the sex ratio in, in itself, the fact that it's skewed is itself evidence that there is something uh, wrong. It's itself evidence that there is um, less demand for health for, uh, for, for, you know, for women and for men. Um, but, uh, and then what, what we find in the claims data um, is maybe some of the mechanisms through which the sex ratio uh, end up, ends up being skewed. Uh, if you don't take women to the hospital when they have a chronic kidney condition, they are gonna die because without dialysis, you die, okay? 
so so that um, the sex ratio cannot explain what we see. What we see can explain the sex ratio. Um, so um, the second uh, key fact that I wanted to put out is the fact that there seems to be relative low levels of investment in preventative health. Okay, and so what do I mean by that? Um, this is the results of a number of, um, of randomized experiments that were done um, where people randomly vary the price at which a preventative was available and tracing out the demand. Okay, so they started with some of my own work looking at bed nets um, in, in, um, in Kenya, here with pregnant women, with Jessica Cohen, we have a paper where we uh, you know, randomize the price at which health facilities would allow pregnant women to purchase a bed net upon coming for prenatal care. And we found that when it's free, every woman takes it home. When um, they have to pay you know, 10 cents, um, almost everybody gets one, 92%. When they have to pay 20 cents, it goes down to 80%. And when they have to pay 50 cents, it becomes you know, too much. And then you're down to 40%. So very kind of like steep um, slope here. So you, 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 women value the product. They take it when it's free. I can also show you that you know, they actually use it when it's free. Um, but they, uh, they, they, they cannot pay very much. And that's because it's a you know, take it or leave it offer. You show up for prenatal care. You can, if you have the money on you, you can get it. If you don't have the money, you cannot. In a separate study also in Kenya, where I gave people three months to find the money. So they have three months to redeem a voucher to get a bed net. Then the, the demand is not as downward, uh, doesn't, doesn't slope as quickly. You can see here that, you know, for the same price at which in a take it or leave it offer at the, the clinic, you know, many women are not able to pay. If the household has three months to come and put the money, now the demand is about, you know, 80%, so it's much higher. But still, when the price of the Bennett is $3, which is still a 50% subsidy, okay? So a Bennett costs about $6. So this is a 50% subsidy for a product that lasts five years. Um, still less than 20% of households um, are gonna be able to pay that, okay? So these were some of the first uh, studies, but then many people have replicated this design and randomize the price at which people could buy you know, vitamins, soap. Uh, you know, myself as co-authors, we work with a plastic uh, latrine slab. This is like slabs to uh, make your latrines um, uh, more hygienic. Water filters, uh, you know, chlorine. And, and overall, the key finding is that for all these products, the demand at full price is very low. At full price, the demand is typically below 20%. And you need to have very high subsidy levels to get high coverage, okay? And so that's what I mean when I say that there are low levels of investments in preventative health. I mean that at full price, even if it's an actually actually fair price in the sense that, you know, you get more return for the product over the years in terms of uh, saved, um, uh, creative uh, costs than you spend on the product itself, um, people are not going to be able to pay, okay? Or they're not going to be willing to pay, okay? So the question uh, we're going to ask is whether people, um, you know, don't care about health, that's why they don't want to pay much, um, or maybe they don't know the returns to this technology, so that goes back to the question that Mariano asked. Um, or maybe they don't have the money to invest in preventative technologies. And so it's really a liquidity constraint story, okay? So we're gonna be able to dispense very quickly with the first uh, conjecture. Uh, people do care about health, okay? They uh, do care I about health. another question here, Pascaline, just uh, yes. what about peer effects? So suppose you invest in a technology, if you think about bed nets, for example, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody else is investing in bed nets and then you're interacting with these other people uh, similarly, when you're thinking about uh, other kinds of yeah. other kinds of uh, diseases that are con uh, infectious diseases, relative yeah. to uh, those no, that yeah, absolutely. Are. No, so you're very right. So it could very well be. So it could very well be that. Uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way on my slides. Um, it could very well be that the returns to these technologies are actually low. The private returns are low. Okay, I'm not putting it here as an option. Because of all the products I showed you here, there's only one product that would explain that. That's uh, deworming, okay? So it's true that the, re the private returns to deworming are extremely low. If you deworm your children, but your neighbors don't deworm their children, then it's not a good deal because your children get infected right away. 
and the, the deworming peel actually is kind of not fun, they side effects. And so there's like some private cost on top of the pecuniary cost. Um, and so that could explain why people are not willing to pay anything for deworming. But for the other stuff, for bed nets, you know, the private returns, even if you're the only one using, using one, uh, you know, the private returns are high. Uh, that has been shown. There, there are some spillovers. If, if a lot of people are protected in the area, even if, if a lot of people sleep under a bed net, even those that do not sleep under a bed net are going to be protected, okay? But if there is a lot of malaria in your area, sleeping under a bed net does protect you quite a lot. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, I mean, I, for example, I spent a lot of time in my life in malaria endemic countries. Uh, I've never gotten malaria, you know, right. uh, touch, <laughs> on, knock on wood. Uh, I've always slept under, you know, bed nets uh, at night. So <laughs> that obviously that's, all, that's not the most, uh, you know, this type of anecdotal evidence should not convince you, but, but there is, um, there is a lot of medical literature on that. So for all of these things, um, like hand washing and, uh, and the, 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 actually the private returns are shown to be, to be, to be high. Okay. It's, for the warming it's not. So the question um, is. So that's that why I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, ex I'm going to focus on the case where the private returns are high. You would expect people, you know, if they had the full information and they had the, the, some weight on health and they had the finances to invest in them. Sorry, Shikram. Uh, there was a question that, uh, did you make sure there is easy access to these technologies? Uh, yeah, absolutely. All of this is making it super easy because you go to someone's household and you say, do you want to buy this? No. <laughs> do you want to buy this phone? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is not for phones, but like, so like, it's very often people go to people's houses with the product and you can, you can, you can, you can, um, you can buy it right there. So it's like extremely convenient. Or if you're gonna to want to give people more time, uh, you give them a voucher. So in my case here for the studies with business with vouchers, um, I, uh, I gave them a voucher that was redeemable uh, at the local store. So it's a store where, you know, very, where they go almost every day to buy stuff. Um, so there's like very, very uh, little, little cost there. Okay. So um, I'm gonna, not go very deep into uh, um, arguing that they don't care about health because I don't think that's the case. I think people do care about health. In fact, they spend a lot of money on treatment. So what I just showed you for prevention does not apply to treatment. People spend a lot of money on treatment. In fact, you know, in, in Kenya, the same context where I showed you that the willingness to pay uh, for anti-malarial bed nets is very low. Well, people spend a lot of money on treating malaria when it, when it arises. 70% of households have at least one presumed malaria episode per month, and then spend on average $1.70 on medicines, uh, which is more than a day's wage when a presumed episode happens. I say presumed because it turns out that access to testing is not great, so at least it was not you know, back then when we measured this. And a lot of these presumed episodes are actually not malaria, although they look like malaria. And so not only households spend money, they, they waste money, unfortunately, because they don't know that they don't have malaria, so they end up buying the wrong medicine. Um, there is also evidence that uh, households go into very serious debt to deal with health emergencies, um, or uh, they sell assets, they can they work more. Um, and there's a famous uh, paper by Anthony Kosha on that. Uh, and also they can take on risky jobs. And here I want to mention a paper by Jonathan Robinson from UC Santa Cruz, a longtime uh, collaborator of mine, uh, and Ethan Ye, uh, in a paper in 2011, they showed that uh, women in Kenya um, were what's called informal sex workers in the sense that they have um, a few sexual partners um, from time to time to, to, to get money. They are not like you know, full-time commercial sex worker, but they do get money from some partners. They're gonna take more risk uh, when they have a sick child. So on a day they have a child with sick and it's medicine, um, they are going to be more likely to engage in risky sex that pays more. So that means unprotected sex, um, for example, which is, you know, putting themselves at the risk of HIV over the long run in order to be able to get medicine for that child uh, in the short run. So all of this suggests that, you know, this very high willingness to pay uh, to be able to treat somebody who is suffering um, means that, you know, health matters. Uh, people also report being stressed about health issues a lot, okay? And this is uh, some... Uh, something that Banerjee and Duflo in their pro-economics book mentioned, 
uh, for many interviews that they've done that own health or health of relatives is a primary source of stress and anxiety among the poor. So that's why I think uh, you know we can dispense with the idea that people don't care about health. Although I want to you know go back to the point I made just before, which is that they don't care equally about everyone's health. Okay, so that's important. There is discrimination or, or, or differential treatment within the household, um, but uh, at least in some parts, um, some parts of the world. So that needs to be kept uh, in the background, but it's not going to explain um, everything. Okay. Um, so point number two, maybe they don't know the return to these technologies, and uh, you know, indeed, <laughs> um, very often people lack information on either the cause of their poor health or what to do about it. And so you know, there's a lot of um, uh, information campaign that has been done um, over, over the years. And, and often information campaigns have a bad name. My sense is that people have this idea in the back of their mind that you know, information is, doesn't make a difference. I wanna clarify uh, that I don't think that's true. I think information is absolutely necessary. It may not be sufficient. It may not always be sufficient. There are many cases where it's not going to be sufficient. It is obviously important. You know, you need to start with the right information. Okay, and so here are some examples, and the references are in this annual review of economics um, that I written in 2011, and a more recent handbook chapter with Ted Miguel in 2016. Um, you know, there's some you know examples from Bangladesh when when people were told that their um, tube well, their child tube well was contaminated with arsenic. Uh, that led them to switch water source. We're going to come back to this um, later. Um, in India, in a study where they told people that their water source was contaminated with E. coli, that's contamination with fecal matter, um, that spurred people to start uh, using bleach to purify. In Nigeria, it was in a, you know, a while back when bed nets were not long lasting, they needed to be treated regularly. Uh, with insecticide, people were told, okay, you need to treat your bed then with insecticide. You know, people were more likely to do that. Um, there's a very famous uh, ORS uh, campaign in Egypt where women uh, were taught how to use ORS, uh, oral rehydration source, how to mix, you know, sugar and, and, um, and, and salt and water to do the, the, the treatment. Um, and that had very large um, effects, okay? Uh, people sometimes lack information about their own health status. That's what I mentioned before. Uh, the study we had with Jessica Cohen and Simon Schenner, when we found that in Kenya, many people actually did not know what they had. They thought they had malaria when they, when they had not. So information is going to be important. You need to know what you have. You need to know what you can do. Uh, that's the first step. Okay. Um, and then you know, another possible reasons why we're going to have low investments in, in high return technologies could be the um, that people don't have the money to invest. So maybe even if I have information, uh, maybe I just don't have the 50 cents that I need to buy the Bennett. Okay. And so here, you know, there is quite a bit of evidence that people are liquidity constrained. Um, first of all, because they often don't have access to credit. Um, maybe less so in, in South Asia, where microfinance has been you know, widespread, than in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's uh, not as common. Okay. Um, so people don't have access to credit. And when they do get access to credit, investments tend to increase quite a bit. So in Morocco, we did a, a study um, looking at the demand for clean water. Um, this was providing people access to a water connection on credit. And when people had access to the credit, uh, demand was 62%. When they didn't have the credit, it was only 10%. Okay, So just having access to the credit facility uh, makes a huge difference in the demand. Likewise, um, a study in India by Tarozi, uh, uh, at all found that if you try to tell households to buy a bed net uh, at full price uh, without any credit, only 10% are going to purchase it. This was in Orissa where there's still some malaria. Uh, but if you allow people to purchase it on credit, it goes up to 55%. So these are huge increases, you know, from 10 to 62%, 10 to 55%. This just means that people are liquidity constrained. You, relay, you release that constraint. Um, you know, uh, in the form of this, these programs where providing credit specifically for these products um, and then see uh, increases. This is, uh, the last one is an example from Uganda selling improved cook stoves on credit. Why does an improved cook stove matter for health? Because it doesn't pollute. It really uh, reduces, uh, you know, indoor air pollution by a lot. And they find that it increases take up from 4% at food price 
to 26% at full price with credit, okay? Um, now you may say, well, okay, but if people can, can purchase these things on credit, why can't they slowly save their way? Um, if, because after the idea is if I'm able to, you know, put away, um, you know, the money every week to repay the creditor, why can't I just do that in form of saving? And after maybe a year, I've acquired enough saving um, to, to purchase the product. And here, uh, you know, it could be that access to savings tools is low. So I've actually also done some work on this uh, with Jonathan Robinson, whom I just mentioned. Um, or it could also be that actually credit is much better because if you can get the product on credit, then while you have to repay, you're already benefiting from the health uh, outcome. Um, so, so, but if I don't have access to the prevent, preventative products, then I'm hit by bad health at a higher frequency, and these health emergencies can just wipe out my savings. Okay, so it's a vicious cycle of poor health where you know, I'm trying to put away some money to buy a bed net, but before I've gotten enough to buy the bed net, I'm hit by a malaria episode, and I end up spending all of my savings into in, in the treatment uh, for malaria. Okay, um, so you know this is kind of like a some key facts, you know, people do care about health, uh, even if not equally for everyone. Um, they seem to not always know the returns to technology, so providing information is very important. Um, and they also seem to be having uh, facing liquidity constraints. Okay, so given this, what can be done? It seems like, okay, we should make sure people have information. That's going to be number one. Um, in context where there seems to be discrimination within the household, we may want to incentivize parents to invest in girls. Uh, in you know, uh, more in, in in many um, contexts where people seem to be really having uh, difficulties coming up with the liquidity to invest in prevention, maybe subsidizing technology in the short run could help because if we give people access to huge subsidies for a lot of these health products in the short run and then they become healthier, they can generate more income that puts them over the hump and then they are able to, re, you know, to replace this um, or to invest on their own uh, in prevention. And finally, uh, you know, provide uh, credit. So we're gonna see um, what we know about this, uh, you know, more generally uh, now. So on information, I'm gonna say, yes, people need to have information, but it's actually important to be very exhaustive in the information you provide, okay? <laughs> Because uh, if you provide information about one issue and you make that issue very salient, uh, but you don't actually you know, mention some other related issues um, that may backfire, uh, or if you don't provide all the information that people need to make the right, uh, the right decisions, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, there is a sentiment that sometimes uh, information may be bad. So for example, if you go on Google, and try to find information about the dose response of cancer to smoking. It's gonna be very tricky. They don't tell you, oh, if you smoke two cigarettes a day, this is what your risk is. If you smoke four, this is what your risk is. It's very hard to know that information, okay? Um, and, and my conjecture is that it's because, well, the recommendation is not to smoke at all, okay? And obviously smoking is addictive, so maybe that's the right thing to do, but you know, it's like if people knew that smoking just one cigarette a day was actually not that bad at all, well, I mean, I don't know if it's true because this information is not there. <laughs> Imagine that it were true, okay? Then the worry is that, oh, but then people will just like smoke, you know, one cigarette a day instead of not at all. But then, you know, maybe from one a day you sleep to two a day to three a day. So this, idea that maybe it's better to, to scare people away completely uh, or not tell them everything uh, because we want them to just like go to the corner solution. The corner solution is don't engage in the risky behavior. Um, maybe that's gonna work better. And here my word of caution is like, well, no, because don't, you know, don't, don't actually, um, uh, you know, under, underestimate the fact that having free information can help people uh, find what's right for them. And so the example I have is actually some work I've done uh, that was in the context of my, my PhD, uh, you know, 14 years ago, uh, which was in the context of HIV prevention in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, in the, in the 2000s, just like in the US, uh, you know, still in some states up to now, 
There is this idea that you know, if you talk about sex with young children, you may actually give them ideas. Okay, and so you don't actually want to do sex education because if you talk about sex too early, you give too much information too early, you may get people to you know, to, you may encourage people to do stuff you don't want them to do. And and likewise, if you talk about condoms and you say, well, you know, you can have sex with condoms and then you're safer than um, uh, without condoms. You know, there's worry that oh, then people are going to have sex when really they should abstain. If you want to prevent it, HIV, yes, you want people to abstain. Okay, and so this general risk avoidance versus risk reduction information is also then with like syringe, uh, you know, syringe exchange programs. In some countries, try to deal with uh, drug addiction by allowing drug addicts to come and cl can, uh, get clean syringes and and drug without having to, you know, go into criminality for it. Uh, saying, you know, it's better to be a clean drug addict than unclean. And others like, no, 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 if you actually allow people to be a clean drug addict, then you encourage the behavior. So this is a, you know, broader debate. And in the context of HIV prevention in Kenya, there was, you know, this idea that you really don't want to talk about sex. Um, you don't want to talk about condoms. You just want people to abstain. And so I did a study that was trying to say, well, maybe just providing people information about abstinence is not going to get that far because maybe at some point people don't want to abstain anymore. And at the point you can't abstain anymore, if you have no information to help you figure out how to be safer within the non-corner solution, uh, then what do you do? So I couldn't go around schools in Kenya and talk about condoms because it was not allowed, but instead I uh, designed an information campaign around the fact that the type of partner you choose is very important for how much risk you face, okay? And this was at the time in, in Kenya, uh, as in many countries in East Africa, where the HIV rates were very high um, and they were much higher for young women than for young men. So if you look at the, pre the prevalence of HIV by age group, you could see that uh, 15 to 19 year old women had a you know, uh, 3% percentage, uh, 3 prevalence compared to you know, very small for the men that same age. And in 2024, it was almost 9% for the girls um, and only 2% for the boys. And so if you go to a classroom, um, you know, uh, eighth grader and you say, what's going on? What explains this? They'll tell you readily, oh, it's very simple. These girls are having sex with those guys and these girls are having sex with those guys, okay? And so that's what's going on. There's what's called cross-generational cross sex. And so the girls are getting infected earlier uh, by older partners, but then they don't necessarily marry those older partners. And then they later on end up marrying some younger partners and then infecting the younger partners who themselves become uh, what's called sugar daddies, which means when they're a bit older, they start having uh, younger partners to whom uh, they, give, they give money. Because if you then ask, well, why do these girls have sex with those guys? They say, well, because actually those guys are much um, safer if you think about another risk that you face when you have sex, which is uh, the risk of getting pregnant. And why are they safer? They're not safer in the sense that they're less likely to make you pregnant. It's just that they are more likely to marry you if you do get pregnant, okay? And so for girls, it was very salient at the time that uh, an older partner was a safer bet because if you get pregnant, he's gonna marry you and take care of you. Uh, but a younger guy is not gonna marry you and then you are uh, you know, stuck uh, with a baby on your own. But that information about the HIV rates, they didn't know. So when I showed them that, they could explain what was going on, but they actually had no idea that this would look like that. They thought that, in fact, they saw that the older guys were safer um, because the curriculum never says uh, to pay attention to the age of the partner and just says, don't go to the disco with young boys, they are bad, okay? So this focus on abstinence only meant that girls had no sense that choosing a young guy was actually safer than choosing an older guy. Okay, so I just told them that information and that made a big difference. When I told them about, you know, I called it the sugar daddy risk information, it actually reduced the likelihood that they got pregnant and especially that they got pregnant with an older man, uh, you know, by, by a lot. And in contrast, uh, a teacher training, a teach, training the teachers on the official abstinence only curriculum uh, made no difference whatsoever. Okay, and that's because it's like pushing people to a corner solution that's not actually uh, practical. Okay, so that's uh, one question. Uh, could yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, yes. you so if information is a constraint, how likely are people to believe provided information, and does it matter who is the provider in this situation? 
Do we know Absolutely. anything about this? Absolutely, it matters. It, it may it may very much matter with the provider. Um, so so. Um, in fact, so this intervention that I designed was was kind of like adopted by a number of NGOs um, afterwards. Okay, um, and uh, and and Young Love in Botswana did a version where they relied on the teachers to provide the information. And when you rely on the teachers to provide the information, it doesn't work as well. And that's in part because just uh, you know many of the teachers actually happen to be you know men in that age group. Or, you know, of that age group, and they are themselves, <laughs> um, you know, they are themselves, uh, you know, sugar daddies potentially. Um, but 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 um, but also because they they don't have the same like peer um, rapport necessarily to the to the to the students. So when I did it with peers, uh, which means young young role models like the ones I had used in my study, where it was you know. Um, uh, two young women who were, you know, you know, uh, could 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 um, relate to the young kids, and they didn't have this like teacher-student relationship. They were students who were much more free to open up. Um, that worked much better. So the the messenger matters um, absolutely. Uh, it doesn't mean that teachers can't be used. It means that you know, for them to be effective, they would have to be trained. Um, or uh, my recommendation, something that I think is a good middle ground, is to have somebody come around, someone who works for like they said, the health ministry who goes around school to school to provide the information. Uh, somebody who can be an outsider from the point of view of the students um, uh, and, and, and who's gonna have uh, an easier time engaging. I mean, it can be tried quite tricky to talk about, and especially in the context, uh, you know, if, if, if the official curriculum says you shouldn't talk about anything but abstinence, it can be quite tricky for a teacher to feel comfortable talking about uh, sex to, to, to students. So having somebody who's very well trained, knows how to do that, know how to create a rapport is gonna be very important. Uh, there are, you know, here I'm showing you that, you know, when you give information, you may wanna give the full information. Um, I'm not making the claim that information always makes a difference. Uh, I'm saying it's a necessary, it's a necessary condition. But we are making the point that it may not be sufficient, and I fully agree there are uh, situations where it's not sufficient. And do we also know about uh, the role family can play in terms of uh, providing this kind of information? Or are often a lot of these issues uh, things that young people don't want to discuss with family, and so that those are not the right messengers to use for programs like this. I mean, it, it really depends. If you think that the family has the information then um you know then that's that's already much better than if i mean doesn't have the information um in the, in the context of hiv in Sub-Saharan africa in the you know in the 2000s i think it's fair to say that the families did not have the information the parents did not have the information um this information that i shared you know i tabulated this from the demographic and health survey um you know at the time uh, but it's not something that actually was, you know, on billboards or everywhere. People just didn't know that information. So, and getting the information to students through schools is actually extremely cost effective. Okay, that's the reason why maybe a lot of information campaigns happen through schools is because that's, there's already a structure, everybody is there, there's no extra cost for people to come. If you want to give the information to the parents, then it's much more costly because, you know, how do you find them? You have to make them come to the school, maybe they won't come, they are busy. Um, then you can try to route message through other, you know, um, uh, maybe through churches or through um, other community-based organizations. But schools have this really nice feature. In most countries now, school is mandatory at least at the elementary level, and so you can really reach very almost, uh, you know, many many households through schools. Thank okay. You. So another cautionary tale is uh, back to the example of the Bangladesh arsenic information campaign that I mentioned before. Um, here, it turns out, as I said, if you tell people there is arsenic in your tube well, people are like, oh, oh, I, sh I should pay attention. Uh, and they switch, um, you know, to some extent to uh, either like deep tube wells, which are less likely to, to become contaminated with arsenic, um, or to surface water, okay? But it turns out that if you switch to surface water, that's actually not a very good idea because surface water is much more likely to have E. coli, to have fecal, fecal contamination, which causes viral disease. 
and, and in fact, that was the reason why so many households had shadow tubers in their backyards, is because you know, 30 years prior, the government of, Bas uh, of Bangladesh had done a huge campaign um, to reduce diarrheal diseases, telling people to stop taking water from, uh, stop using surface water, it's not clean. Dig tube wells, and people did. But then, you know, 30 years later, they realized, uh oh, there is arsenic, not great. And then there are all these efforts to test the uh, tube wells and to identify which one had arsenic, which one had not. Arsenic doesn't kill you, you know, um, you right away. <laughs> it's not like in the movies. Uh, it's actually a very slow process, but it gives you a lot of side effects over time, like um, gout and stuff like that. Um, so, so people didn't know that it was there. It's only once the government uh, realized that there was contamination that people got information. There is no way you could know otherwise. But at the time they told people, beware of arsenic, they forgot to say, well, you should also be aware of fecal contamination. Somehow there was this you know, institutional you know, knowledge that was gone that there was a reason why people had switched towards tube wells in the first place. And so people did not get all the information. They were told there's a huge risk of arsenic without being told at the same time, there's a risk of E. coli in the surface water. And so this very nice paper by Gorman, Phil Gunnester and Hustam shows that household that end up switching away from their arsenic tube well and then seeing a 46% increase in mortality, in child mortality uh, because of uh, diarrheal disease, okay? So it's another question I tell. If you give information, if you try to make one risk salient, don't forget the others, okay? Um, so that's, um, that's, that's what I wanted to say about information. Um, but again, information is kind of necessary, not necessarily sufficient, okay? So even when people have information, sometimes they're not gonna engage in the behavior that you want them to engage. Um, and so we still have to understand why. So I mentioned um, uh, gender issues. Um, there are a few studies that have tried to see whether it works to incentivize parents to invest in girls. The jury is still out. Uh, I'm gonna like skip for the sake of time. I have a former student at Stanford, uh, Odyssey Agnier, who did this study um, uh, in looking at the Ayana uh, Apnibeti Abnadan program, um, which was kind of like telling parents once your girl child is born, you know, in 18 years, you're going to get a payout. Um, the goal was to reduce uh, the imbalances in the you know, uh, sex ratio. Um, she finds no effect. More recently, there's a randomized control trial done in Bangladesh um, by uh, Gorman, Field, and Ben Astor, um, where they find um, that you, you, you know, if you make, if you give a, a carrot, which is closer, so you don't tell parents that the child, the child is born, in 18 years will give you stuff. It's when the daughter is 16, you say, if she's not yet married by 18, then we'll give you stuff. Uh, then it can help delay uh, marriage, and so child marriage reduces, okay? Uh, and if you don't marry your girls um, as quickly, then you, you keep investing in them for longer, okay? So that's maybe a bit promising. Um, but on the whole, there is still, you know, a lot more work that needs to be done to understand how to incentivize parents to invest as much in their girls as they do in their boys in context where there is uh, differential investment. Um, but so let me um, focus on, on subventions um, for preventative technologies. Uh, here, the idea is, okay, maybe we can subsidize them in the short run to put people over the hump, okay? And you know, here, the way you wanna think about whether that's a good idea, I'm gonna write um, the, the, uh, the objective function of um, the social planner here, let's say the principal who values the health benefits uh, that um, you know, she gets out of people using a health product, but you also care about the non-health utility of people and alternative uses of fun. Okay, so you're gonna maximize this objective function, which depends on uh, essentially the, the health benefit that you get um, when a household uses a product I appropriately, then you wanna put some dollar value to this health benefit. Okay, so that's gonna be Z. You only get these benefits if the household actually uses or the individual uses the product. Okay, so that's a binary variable telling you the person uses the product. And then this is gonna be the non-health utility of the household. That's gonna be the cost, um, the marginal cost of public funds is lambda, and this is a subsidy that you're providing to households to get this health product. 
and then the contribution value. So why am I writing this down? Because if you're going to say, well, I'm going to use subsidies, I'm going to make the price of a product cheaper so that more people can get it. You have to think about what's going to happen. If you uh, increase the subsidy by an amount DS, what happened is that now you have some people who were not before using the product. Uh, sorry, some people be before were not um, able to get the product, who are now going to get the product uh, and use it. So you get these marginal users, you only get them if they get the subsidy, okay? So this is what you want by increasing the subsidy. You want to get a whole bunch of people who are new users who will not get the product otherwise. And these new users, they are gonna have these benefits B of having the product, BMAR, uh, valued at this subsidy value. But when you induce all of these new users, the concern is that you may also induce a whole bunch of people to take the product because now it's uh, you know it's cheaper, but maybe they are not going to be um, they are not going to be using it. Okay, so you have this tech mar. This is a number of households that you induce to acquire the product with your subsidy, and it may be different from use mar, which is the proportion of households that are used to change their behavior and use the product. Okay, and see if you have a wedge between who you incentivize to take the product and who you incentivize to use the product, then you may end up having a whole bunch of what we call uh, errors of inclusion. You end up subsidizing the product and putting it in the hand of people who actually are not gonna be using it appropriately. So they cost you money because they take the product, but they don't use it. On top of that, when you subsidize the product, you get all the info marginals. These are all the people who would actually have bought the product at full price. Now, because you have a subsidy, uh, if you can't target the subsidy, they are going to get it cheaper. So they cost you money because you are subsidizing it for them as well. So in thinking about whether you want to subsidize, you have to think hard about whether you have a lot of inframarginal takers that you're going to subsidize when you don't need to for them to generate the benefit. And potentially you have a lot of you know, takers who are not going to use. And you also have to ask yourself whether the marginal users have a health benefit, which is as high as you know, the other users, OK? So that's what I'm going to uh, show you now how to you know, uh, look at. What type of experiment do you want to do to be able to understand the extent to which you have this gap between who uses and who takes the product? Okay? It, does the subsidy uh, induce some people to take the input uh, but not use it? Um, do those people have actually low returns? Um, and do you have a high cost of the program because of infant marginals? These are all you know, eminently empirical questions. And so from one context to the next, it may vary. From one product to the next, it may vary. Uh, but we can think about the type of uh, data that you need to be able to understand in a specific context for a specific product, what is it uh, gonna look like and whether a subsidy is the right thing to do and what should be the amount of the subsidy, okay? Uh, so Pascaline, I've done the bench of those, yes. Uh, so there was a question earlier about um, uh, the, the role of time. So the question was really that uh, can spending more on treatment than prevention be explained by exponential discounting or uh, some other behavioral preference like hyperbolic discounting or underestimation of probability. So that's, I guess, to do with whether there's some time or something built into your model. Yes. So there's a discount factor in a very simple model and depending on the shape that this, this I mean, the, the shape of discounting uh, whether if you have a beta delta model, which is going to be, uh, you know, quasi hyperbolic discounting, then people don't, you know, think about the future too much. They are like focused on the on the present. Then yes, that could explain. Um, that could explain. It. I'm gonna, um, uh, you know, say at at most it's going to explain a small fraction because the great majority of people are not quasi hyperbolic discounters. And if you look at you know the extent to which people invest in you know in education in many other things that have returns over the long term. It could be hard to explain why they would, you know, they would invest in education but not uh, in preventative health if it were just due to discounting. So I think there are some cases where discounting may be there. We're going to touch upon a few things, but for me, it's not the first order thing. I think there are other problems. Um, so okay. um, yeah. So this is back to the bedness study. I showed you some of that data before. This is uh, the take up uh, among pregnant women at uh, clinics. Um, whether or not they, they purchased the, the, the bed net. Um, here, the, you know, the, 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 you know, 
uh, x axis is spread. Um, so these are still very, very small amounts. And for this small amount, uh, take up is only 40% compared to 100% of my industry. And this is usage. This is after three months when I went back to these households and checked, no, sorry, two months and checked whether they were using. And you can see that actually the usage rate um, is, is uh, you know, in proportion is the same across the price points, okay? So it's about, you know, 60% of households at all price points that are using within two months, okay? Um, and so it's not 100% using. It's in part, the, you know, if you ask these pregnant women, why are you not using your bed nets after two months? They say, oh, because I'm waiting until the baby is born, which is actually a bad idea because they should use it in pregnancy. So we told them uh, to do that when we visited them. Um, uh, or they say, I'm waiting, uh, you know, for, for my, um, you know, uh, my kitchen to be, uh, I'm building a kitchen outside. I don't want to use the bed net while I'm uh, cooking inside because it's going to um, damage it. So people were actually cherishing the, the bed net. Everybody, 100% of the people still had it and could show it to us nicely wrapped uh, in the package, even if they were not using it. Uh, it's about 60% of people using it. And it's not differential across price points. So this suggests that the, you know, the by increasing the subsidy, you don't actually increase the share of people uh, who don't who don't use. Um, and this is in the one with the vouchers. When I give people the voucher, the usage rate after one year is much higher now. It's about 90%. Um, and it's it's uh, on the whole not very differential across uh, um, across price points. Um, the, you can see here actually, in fact, in percentage terms, it's like a smaller percentage of people who've paid a lot for the bed net who are using it compared to people who got it for free. So by making it free, you don't end up having a lot of people um, who waste it, okay? There's one product for which I found something very different. Um, it's water, uh, water uh, purification, chlorine. Uh, if you give chlorine for free to households um, in Kenya, we found that just below 40% of people were actually using it, okay? So we dropped the whole supply, a year worth of supply of chlorine to treat your water to prevent, uh, you know, viral diseases. Uh, we dropped a whole year supply. And when we visit people after four months, we find that less than 40% of them actually use chlorine. That's, we treated, we tested their water to see if there was chlorine residuals in the water, okay? Um, so that's not great because they have a lot of, errors of inclusion. You end up subsidizing a whole bunch of people who don't put the product to good use. So that's very expensive for you um, as a policymaker. Now, if you don't subsidize fully and you charge people 10 shillings, which is a 50% subsidy, not a 100%, it's 50% subsidy, you actually end up losing a lot of people. So the usage goes down from 38% to, uh, you know, I don't remember what the number is, uh, but I think it's like, 15%, okay? So you, you actually lost, uh, lose, sorry, you lose a lot of people, okay? You lose a lot of people, uh, and if you value the, 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 the health of these children here, you know, the gap between this and this, you want them to be protected, how do you do that? If you charge, you know, you lose them. Uh, if you don't charge, you end up subsidizing a whole, whole bunch of people. So you have this trade-off between type one and type two errors. These are the type two errors or errors of, the, of exclusion. These are the type one errors, the errors of inclusion. We know from econometrics, it's very hard to reduce both at the same time, okay? So um, how can we do that? I'm gonna skip because I'm not doing great on time. Um, we actually, uh, in, in a study with, uh, Vivian Hoffman, Michael Kramer, and Alex Zweni, we actually find a solution. We reduced type one and type two errors at the same time. And how did we do that? We used what we call an ordeal mechanism, okay? That means make households pay some small non-monetary non costs to prove that they care, okay? And so you know, I'm gonna skip to make sure I have a chance to, to explain. In that same study, I showed you before these two points, this one and this one. In that same study, we actually had a fourth group. This was also randomized, whether it was free delivery or 10 shillings or 20 shillings. We had a four random group where we gave people coupons for free chlorine. It was still free. It was still a whole year supply, okay? But now to actually avail yourself of the whole year supply, you had to go every month to the store to redeem a coupon. 
The store is not particularly far, okay? It's maybe where you go shopping regularly anyway, but you have to keep your orders in order, uh, your coupons in order. You have to not lose them. You have to remember to redeem them. In January, you redeem the January coupon. In February, the February coupon, okay? And when we did that, it worked extremely well because people who don't care for the product don't actually redeem the coupons. And people who care for the products do redeem the coupons. So it's amazing because you end up getting everybody that you want to have, okay, to be covered without much wastage. You lost all of these people. So if you drop it at their home, they don't have to do anything. They take it, they say, oh, thank you, because they don't want to tell you they don't care about chlorine. But if they have to go redeem, they, they don't go, okay? So um, that's... Uh, that's really nice. Obviously, we were very lucky that we targeted the size of the ordeal perfectly to get this, okay? You can get it wrong. If you make the ordeal way too big, it may not work, okay? Um, so, the, in fact, within our sample, we find that, you know, for households that had to go further out to redeem the coupons, the, the take-up rate was, uh, you know, the, the coverage rate was a bit lower, okay? Um, so, you can, you know, um, do a whole bunch of um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, additional work to kind of think about what's the optimal policy uh, since we have a little bit of you know loss um, if the the coupon is not redeemable right um, next to you etc. Some people may be living too far from a redemption center. Um, I'm going to skip for the sake of time, but we estimate in that analysis that uh, it's actually extremely cost effective to give people a hundred percent subsidy. Uh, with the micro ordeal. For most of the parameter space, for most of you know, uh, values of per, per, per DALI uh, averted, you would actually um, do very well with this uh, micro ordeal design, okay? And just um, to show you uh, that replication is important, I actually recently did a replication of this in the context of Malawi um, uh, with um, Basin Niema, Zach Wagner, Amy Rowe, and Aaron Wolf, where we um, exactly replicated this, the Kenya study from 10 years prior uh, in the context uh, of Malawi. And we find identical results. Uh, uh, we find that coupons are extremely effective at targeting precisely the households who are gonna want to get the product, okay? And in that Malawi replication, we're actually able to look at health impacts. And we find that uh, the coupon program reduced uh, reduced uh, illnesses quite a bit, reduced diarrhea, the, the, uh, you know, waterborne diseases quite a bit, okay? Uh, and it reduced it more for people who um, who who uh, have uh, an unprotected water source, okay? So people who already have a protected water source, they are going to be less likely to redeem the coupons than people who um, uh, have an unprotected water source, and as a result, the health impacts come from those who um, have an unprotected water source. Okay, so um, was you know very surprised to find the results uh, hold so well in a different context. Um, now it has me convinced that you know the same um, kind of work that I did on the pricing of bed nets, uh, you know, ten years ago, uh, that's convinced me that you know, free distribution was the right way to go, even that people actually use free bed nets to a great extent. Uh, has now convinced me that for chlorine, you don't want to give it for free through home delivery. You just want to give them for free through coupons programs. Okay. Um, now I'm going to skip that also in the sake of time. Um, and maybe coming to um, some of the other barriers that you alluded to, I have like four minutes. So I apologize, it's going to be rushed. But, you know, the, the, there is, I'm sure many of you are going to. You know, if you could scream at me right now, you would scream and say, but free is not always enough. We know that free is not always enough. Uh, individuals may face other barriers. There may be social barriers to take up. Uh, there may still be some lack of information on benefits. Um, maybe sometimes the hassle costs uh, are too big. Um, and so in such cases, incentivizing people to do the right thing, which is giving a subsidy that's greater than 100%. Not only I give it to you for free, but on top of it, I pay you to go do the behavior. I give you you know, a reward if you do the behavior, that may be uh, necessary. And there is this famous study that I'm sure you all know about by Banerjee, Duflo, Benester, and Kotari, which was, a, a, you know, um, discussed at length um, in the Nobel Prize um, announcements just over a year ago, 
that looked at immunization in uh, Uraid for Rajasthan, and they showed that uh, one of the barriers that people face when getting immunized is the fact that there is not uh, great reliability of the supply. And we're going to get back to that uh, when we talk tomorrow about uh, the, the delivery side. Uh, and so just providing immunization camps that were very reliable increased the likelihood that people would get their kids vaccinated by quite a bit. Uh, but that effect of the camp actually tapers off uh, over, over the course of the uh, different immunization. So the camps themselves only increases the share of kids who get fully immunized at this five immunization from 6% to 18%. Okay, that's huge, it's tripling, but 18% is still a, a far cry from the 100% that you would like to see. And what they did is that in some of the camps, they also they randomized whether or not parents would get an incentive. If you bring your kid for each immunization, you would get a bag of lentils. And then if you did five and you complete the course, then you would get a set of plates or something like that. And that increased uh, immunization, complete immunization to 39%. And so that in their paper, they interpret the fact that this little incentive is really trivial compared to the you know, expected benefit from the immunization as evident that present bias may be a barrier uh, because I have to each time bring my child, bring my child, it's like, you know, I'm kind of, you know, discounting the benefit of the third and the fourth and the fifth immunization. If you don't go in front of me an incentive that I can benefit from immediately, that convinces me uh, to come and do it, okay? Um, so that's, that would be, you know, they interpret this as evident that uh, present bias may be, um, uh, one of the reasons why people put off, keep putting off coming for the third and the fourth immunization, um, but the incentives can uh, overcome that. Uh, but so, for polio yeah. drops, uh, people come to your house, don't they, to give the drops? People visit you to your, uh, people visit your houses to give polio drops. Yeah, for, uh, I, I think, I mean, it, it depends on the context. I think it, for, for polio, I think it, it, may, it, it, may be, uh, it may be the case. Um, I don't know if it was the case at the time in in, in Depot, uh, but it may be the case. But there are many other, you know, the, the other type of, um, you know, there's also the uh, measles, um, you know, DPT, uh, the the no sorry measles and a bunch of other stuff. I don't actually know um, which That's ones. Right. Uh, those are not easy to do at home, but I know for polio yeah. drops, um, maybe it's only in the big cities, but. Um, uh, for my yeah. daughter, they would yeah. come on, on yeah. clock and do it. But yeah. anyway, please carry on. And for polio, I mean, and why polio? If you see why polio, well, precisely because polio, you know, they are trying to eradicate it, right? So polio is something that you need. That's maybe the the the, the, the externality point that Hoini mentioned earlier is very important because polio is precisely the case that when you want everybody to be immunized, otherwise, you know, it it continues, um, uh, you know, spreading. Uh, so that may be why they do an extra effort of going to houses to really, you know, get it done. Um, but for, for some of this, I mean, I guess for measles, it should be the same in principle. So, so they should maybe, you know, maybe that's what uh, needs to happen. So I'm pretty much out of time. So I just wanted to mention very quickly that on credit, I showed you earlier some uh, references to paper that showed if I come to you and I say, do you want to buy this very specific thing on credit? And I'm going to give you a credit just for this. Then it increases the demand for health products. But all of the microfinance studies, many of which have taken place in, in South Asia, uh, they have not seen massive impacts on health. And it's in part because a lot of the microfinance uh, loans are supposed to be you know, for specific uses, for businesses and things like that. So uh, not specifically for, for, for consumption or for, for health investments, but also because it's very difficult to actually observe impacts on health outcomes when uh, there are many, many different uses that people can make of their access to, um, to loan. And so statistical power is going to be an issue. If I have a thousand people, we can now borrow, you know, the likelihood that I see impacts on health uh, is going to be uh, possibly low if over the course of the year I follow them, uh, the share of households that are going to have a, you know, a health problem is going to be, uh, you know, let's say 15%. And so now I'm down to like 150. Um, and, and measuring health outcomes requires large samples uh, to, to be precise. So we don't actually have evidence either one way or the other suggesting that when you expand broadly uh, access to credit and you reduce liquidity constraints, you see impacts uh, on health. But so just to you know make sure that I get that uh, my conclusion across, uh, sorry for taking one minute, extra minute, you know, 
even though I've spent quite a bit of time on these issues of private behavior, I, I, I don't think it should be necessarily, you know, what policymakers spend all their time on. Because we can inform people, we can give them subsidies, we can even pay them, but these are gonna be cost effective. I think it's gonna be more cost effective if we affect the two other elephants in the room, which is the bad geography and the poor supply. So I'm gonna talk about the supply tomorrow and what can be done to increase um, the quality of the delivery and access. Um, but, and I already mentioned yesterday that, you know, uh, believe eradicating malaria should be a first order thing uh, on the international, you know, uh, people with power. Um, and also finding vaccines and cures for more tropical diseases. I think it's something that would have huge returns uh, if, we could if we could incentivize, um, you know, R&D in that domain. Um, expanding the water and electricity grids to make sure everyone has access to clean water, to well-equipped hospitals, and making sure that health professionals uh, do their job. So we're going to talk about this uh, to, tomorrow. Um, but you know, so the to, you know the main takeaway here that there is a lot of low hanging fruits. Okay, we know that bed nets prevent malaria. We know water filters, or water purification uh, kits can can prevent malaria diseases. We know that works. Um, but ultimately, if you think about a household that faces unclean water, as you know, malaria around, dengue around, uh, you know, HIV, all of that stuff, um, they have to constantly think about health. They have to constantly do behaviors to protect themselves. Um, and that's super, that is super time consuming. That's a huge tax. We don't have to do that. I don't have to do any of that. Um, the only thing I have to do is brush my teeth. Okay. That's about it. Otherwise, everything is fine. The water flowing out of the tap is clean. There's no malaria. There's no nothing. Right now, obviously, I have to wear a mask when I go outside. I have to be careful about COVID. But in, you know, outside of the COVID crisis, uh, we don't have to worry about anything at all. That gives us like so much more, you know, bandwidth. Uh, to focus on some other stuff. But if you have to like think about every little aspect of your life being potentially uh, hazardous to your health, you know, it's just like, too, it's like I think putting too much um, on households, putting the honest way too much on households. And so I really think it's important to focus on the big regions ticket. In the meantime, let's make sure everybody has access to a water filter and a bed net, and at least they don't have to pay for it. Uh, but it shouldn't derail us from focusing on these bigger ticket items. Sorry for taking five minutes extra. Oh, no. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, that was uh, that was very helpful. Um, I, it was quite an incredible feat uh, that you <laughs> that you managed uh, in 90 minutes to go through this uh, very large uh, mass of literature um, and, and very relevant uh, for all of us. And particularly, you know, you're the one you were talking about immunization, because now we're going to have the COVID vaccine and so on. Yeah. So I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, you know, uh, it's quite an incredible feat that you pulled off by uh, by going through so much of this uh, very fascinating sort of micro level information uh, in 90 minutes. Uh, there has been a very large number of questions um, and some more of a theoretical nature in terms of, you know, the preferences and so on and others. So uh, what I could uh, suggest is to the, the attendees is that maybe um, you could email uh, Pascaline, uh, perhaps, so, you know, tomorrow morning, uh, you could maybe spend, because, you know, your talks are in a continuum as they were planned. So maybe yeah. you could, uh, you could just spend a few minutes uh, picking up from the, uh, from these uh, questions from the attendees who will obviously uh, be waiting eagerly for your responses. So okay. uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, um, uh, for for these uh, these insights particularly because i think they are very relevant you obviously have done phenomenal amount of work uh, you know, on these issues in these various countries uh, i also want to make a plug uh, for the remaining sessions uh, we have now 12 sessions in the next four hours where 40 high class papers are going to be presented so i do request um, all of the attendees to please uh, stay tuned in and to attend these talks. And Pascaline, we will see you again uh, uh, bright and early for us uh, uh, <laughs> tomorrow morning at, uh, at uh, 8 a.m. And uh, I think we can let you uh, go back and relieve your, your, your partner from <laughs> housekeeping duties. So thank yeah, by you. Now I hope my kids are asleep. <laughs> yes, that would be, that, would be a, uh, that would be quite relieving, I hope. So, uh, so thank you very much and, um, and, and good Thanks. night to you and, and a good morning to everyone.